Honorable Presidents of the European Union, members of the Nobel Committee, dear friends, heartily welcome to the Nobel Peace Center and the opening of the Nobel Peace Prize Laureate exhibition, the eighth in the series. To most people, the 10th of December is the highlight during the Nobel festivities. But to us, out of all the exciting days at the Nobel Peace Center during the year, today is definitely the most exciting. The opening of the annual Nobel Peace Prize Laureate exhibition by the Peace Prize Laureates, today represented by the presidents of the EU, is a great honor and a pleasure for us. The process of making the Peace Prize exhibition in eight weeks is a challenge. It's a true inspiration, but a very stressful one. When we learn who the Peace Prize Laureate is, on the second Friday in October, the first question we ask ourselves is, what will be this year's concept? How can we convey the efforts and achievements of the Peace Prize Laureates to the audience? What will be the most important message? What with what sh impression shall our visitors leave the Peace Center? For this year's exhibition, we decided to let ourselves be inspired by the words of the Nobel Committee. In the Nobel Committee's reasoning for the Peace Prize laid an intriguing story. The story of how Europe went from being a continent of war to a continent of peace. We decided that this year's exhibition should simply explain why the EU has been awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for 2012. We wanted everyone, regardless of prior knowledge about the EU system or opinions about the EU membership, to understand the reasoning behind the prize. In other words, we wanted to tell the story about EU as a peace project. The exhibition, as you can see it, shows dramatic paintings and iconic photography. It takes you from yesterday's Europe, where conflicts were settled on bloody battlefields, to present-day Europe, then where conflicts are prevented and resolved in the, meetings room, in the meeting rooms through negotiations. We take you through the historical milestones up till today, when 500 million Europeans live in peaceful coexistence within the EU. The Nobel Peace Center would of course like to invite all the 500 million to see the exhibition. However, if everyone accepted, I think we will bump into some logistical challenges. So we are pleased to welcome 200,000 visitors each year from Norway and from abroad, who reach out to a young audience every year our Educators welcome more than 30,000 school children for our educational programs in the exhibitions. We communicate on many platforms and different media. And we also offer seminars, debates, and concerts throughout the year. As I mentioned, the announcement of this year's Peace Prize Laureate was made eight weeks ago. Eight weeks. I don't know about any other museum or gallery that creates an exhibition within such a time. But with a very skilled, experienced, and dedicated team, and a broad range of enthusiastic and helpful partners, we have made it again. The exhibition was made possible by our sponsors and partners, Hydro, Telenor Group, Orkla, ABB, and the Football Association of Norway. And we also heartily thank Minto Norway for the support to this exhibition. But, of course, we would like to thank our main source of inspiration for the exhibition, the Norwegian Nobel Committee. Please welcome its chairman, Mr. Torbjörn Jagland. Dear um, President Barroso and President Martin Schulz, uh, this is a fine and a very important part of the whole uh, Nobel uh, ceremony, actually. Uh, yesterday was a lot of words. Today we can see more of uh, why the Norwegian Nobel Committee 
made the decision. Um, and um, so that also a broader uh, audience may get um, the explanation behind this year's uh, prize. So we are very thankful to the Nobel Peace, Pri Peace Center because uh, you have, as you said, a challenge. You don't, I mean, you have uh, only a few weeks and sometimes you don't know whether the prize winner are able to, to come to, to the ceremony. We are very glad that we this year could choose somebody that were able to travel to, to Oslo. Uh, just one word about uh, the price again, because this is really the good argument. Uh, Europe from the havoc of war to peace. Kofi Annan was asked about this, but the price on the Norwegian television some weeks ago, and he simply said that if one of the 80 million, not 18, but 80 million soldiers that paid their lives during the two wars in the last uh, century would all of a sudden uh, wake up. The one couldn't believe what he saw, what kind of continent we have now. This is uh, in one sentence the reason why the prize was given to the European Union. Thank you so much, Torbjörn Jagland. Dear President Jose Manuel Barroso, dear President Martin Schulz, we're so grateful for you and also President Van Rompuy's personal contribution to this exhibition. During this production, we have learned much about the dreams and visions of the founding fathers of the European Union. But through our meetings with you, we see the same dreams reflected in you. Your enthusiasm affects everyone around you. And the interviews which are over there that you so generously gave as a part of the exhibition, they show that you're not only politicians with a lot of insight and a lot of power, but you also shared with us your own personal stories and your personal engagement for a peaceful Europe. You remind us that the EU's contribution to peace is about more than an institution. In its essence, it's how, it's how the Union has affected the lives of every European. The EU history it is each and every European's history. So we are sure that the interviews will inspire our audience, but we would also like to inspire you. Therefore, to give you and the EU, some piece of advice. We have an activity in the exhibition where we ask our uh, visitors, what is the most important thing the EU can do for peace today? Our hope is, of course, that everyone visiting the exhibition will give us their answer. And as a symbolic opening gesture, we would like to invite the two of you to be the first to answer this question. But we promise to forward all the advices we get to the EU, <laughs> along with your own. So keep in mind that whatever you write, it will come back to you as a reminder. <laughs> so after the speak speech by President Schulz, we'll ask both of you to fill out a card with your brief answer. We will photog photograph the card on the activity table and it will afterwards be displayed on the acrylic board hanging from the ceiling. So, dear presidents, in his will, Alfred Nobel asked the Norwegian parliament, the Stortinget, to appoint the Nobel Committee that should award the Peace Prize. Nobel, in many ways, put the fate of the prize in the hands of the parliaments. So, what is more suitable than to have the president of the European Parliament, Martin Schulz, representing 500 million citizens to open this year's exhibition? Mr. President, the floor is yours. Director of the Peace Center, thank you very much for the warm welcome. President of the Nobel Prize Committee, Dia Thank you very much for 
all your words and once more for the speech yesterday. And I said uh, to the media, uh, Jose Manuel and uh, Hermann van Rompuy and I, we agreed uh, spontaneously when he spoke that we were expecting that he concluded by saying, and now Norway will join the European Union. <laughs> but, uh, not yet. <laughs> Thank you very much for uh, the chance to open the exhibition. Thank you very much for the wonderful days, for the privilege to be uh, so warmly welcomed in this wonderful country and uh, to be awarded with the Nobel Prizes was an unexpected uh, award. It was uh, nevertheless the right decision in an appropriated moment. We need the support expressed by so much people, expressed in this speech uh, we heard yesterday from Jovan Jagland, expressed in all the support we got during the last 48 hours here from so much people here in Oslo and all over in the country. Thank you very much for uh, the encouragement we need. The exhibition shows why we need the encouragement. Ladies and gentlemen, the European Union is a fascinating project. It is a historical one. Look to the pictures here. And I take the example of my friend Jose Manuel Durao Barroso. You see him here with the Prime Minister of Turkey. I presume it was for the opening of the negotiation for Turkish access to the European Union. But you see on the other side a young man of Portugal in the uniform of the fascist youth in Portugal. And he, as a young boy, had to wear the same uniform in the dictatorship of Mr. Salazar and Mr. Gaetano later. And today he is the president, the freely elected president of the European Commission. This is a fascinating development. It was in 1974. It's not 49 or 47, it was 74. The European Union is a continuous project of deepening and developing democracy. Other parts of the world are not democratic one, and therefore I have the chance and I use the opportunity to make an appeal, for example, to the Chinese government to let the Nobel Prize winner Liu Jiaobao to come here and to receive the Nobel Prize. And I want to, to remind all of us that we have the privilege as Nobel Prize recipients on behalf of the European Union to be here. Other awarded people can't, couldn't, couldn't come. And therefore an appeal of a democratic community to a dictatorship, relieve him and let him come to get the prize here in Oslo. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> the exhibition shows the European Union as it is, as a fascinating project, I said it as a democracy, a transnational democracy. I'm the president of 754 <laughs> members from 27 countries. And laws we adopt in the European Parliament are binding for 500 million citizens. And I want to uh, communicate here publicly that I just suggested to the president of the Norwegian Parliament to open a link office of the Parliament of your country in my Parliament because the laws we adopt are in a great number also binding for Norway. So Norway should have an influence on uh, if there are not yet elected Norwegian members in the European Parliament, at least the Parliament could send us a civil servant to cooperate deeper and more with us. <laughs> You see, it is an encouragement to be European, and this is not a one-way encouragement from the non-member state of the European Union, Norway, and the Nobel Prize Committee to go ahead with European integration. Our answer is, come with us. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a chance for me to remind us that nothing is granted forever. I was some days ago in Washington, and in the entrance of the Na National Archives of the United States is written past this prologue. But past is closed. 
that is a prologue to an open future. And we decide about the future. And when we decide about the future, we decide about the future of our children and their children. Is the future of our children so peaceful, socially so balanced as our life is today? Is the environment of our children still an environment they can live in? The climate change is not threatening us. It threatens more our children and their children. Past is prologue. Our contemporary life, what we are doing now, will be for our children the past. And therefore, it is the prologue of their life. That's our responsibility. I was today in Utoya. I thought what I have to say privately as a person, not on behalf of my institution, what I have to say as one of the 500 million citizens of Europe about my feelings related to the Nobel Peace Prize. That was my wish to say it in Utoya. The spirit for which we were awarded is the spirit who was attacked by this gunman on Utoya. Peace, respect, mutual understanding, solidarity across your nation, across the race to which you belong, across the color of your skin, across your belief, respect the individual rights of everybody, that human dignity is guaranteed because we are all, we are not all equal, we are, but we have all the equal rights. That is the spirit of the European Union. That is the spirit of states and nations who create a cross borders, common institutions, to prevent that what you see on the pictures of Dresden never be repeated on our continent. But the demons who led to Dresden, to Coventry, to Auschwitz, are still alive, as we saw on the island of Utoya. The European Union bent with the structures we created, transnational governance, transnational parliamentarism, transnational institutions. We have bent the demons of the 20th century. But we have bent them because the structures control them and keep them under control. If you destroy the structures and the institutions, the demons are faster back than we believe. That's also a message from Utoya, and therefore I was there. To give also an homage to the victims and the relevance of the victims, who pay the price because they believe that our values are the right values. And I want to honor and to conclude with this introduction in the exhibition to thank the Norwegian people, your society, in reacting to this atrocity by saying more democracy, more tolerance, more mutual respect was the right answer. And therefore you gave an example to the world and an example that you share the values of the European Union expressed in the exhibition here. Thank you very much. We would now like to ask you to sign our guest book and to fill out the card with your advice on what the EU can do for peace.
So, could I then ask you, what have you written? Could you start? Okay. It was longer. <laughs> what can you do to, uh, what is the most important thing you can do for peace today? It is, from my point of view, to solve our current economic problems with solidarity and responsibility and integrate further so that we can have a stronger European Union able to defend the values of peace, justice and freedom in the world. Thank you very much. I said past this prologue. Our past was terrible. Europe should be the prologue to a always peaceful future. So, dear President, thank you for your kind advice. This will be a part of the exhibition. And thank you for opening the Nobel Peace Prize Laureate Exhibition 2012. For my generation, peace was something natural. Um, we were the first generation uh, knowing peace all the time. Uh, there were no threat of war at all during those 65 years. Uh, but I, heard this, I hear the stories of my father and my grandfather from the First World War and from the Second World War. Uh, my father had to dig his own grave uh, when he was 17, uh, in the beginning of the war, in May 1940. And it impressed us a lot as we were kids, and uh, I still remember when he told us that story. Um, and my mother uh, was uh, fleeing to France with our mother on bike and so on. But your father dug a grave and then he escaped in, yeah, the, escaped. Uh, in escaped. the last moment. Otherwise I wouldn't be here. Obviously. It's as simple, <laughs> as, simple as that. Eh? Mm. But so we had that, that, uh, that personal testimonies coming from our, our families. And in my case, my father and my, my grandfather and my mother. Uh, but the next generation, my kids, they can hear it from, from me. But that is already far away. Mm. And I think that my grandchildren, for them, it is really history, really history. So we have to convince them with, with other arguments than only the argument of peace, although peace is still a very, very strong argument. Uh, and a sensitive argument in some parts of Europe. Don't forget that uh, 20 years ago there was a fall of the Berlin Wall. That was the end of the Cold War. But the Cold War was a direct consequence of the war. And we have in Europe also the Western Balkans. And they ended a civil war with deeds of genocide 15 years ago. So for them, peace and war are something that is really actual. This is less the case, of course, for Western Europe. For Western Europe, we need new arguments. And the argument, of course, is yeah, cooperation. We are in the same boat. What we are doing together, we are doing better. How would Europe look today without the European Union? No idea. Uh, but if I have an idea, uh, it would be, have been a very dangerous period. Um, because without reconciliation uh, between France and Germany, um, Without those strong bonds created by this economic community, uh, it is very likely that nationalism at a certain moment can come up again and nationalism, that kind of nationalism, can end in war. Right? The European construction was also based on something very concrete, putting coal and steel together, mm -hmm. the basis of war industry. Mm -hmm. And if, if this is conveyed to a supranational uh, authority, the countries itself, the nation states, can wage, can't wage war because they have, simply have no, not the means. If you create a common market, then you become so interdependent that you have no interest in waging war. Uh, a fortiori when you have a common currency. So in a very pragmatic way, the fathers of Europe created something irreversible. Europe is 
is not a model for the rest of the world because that is too pretentious. But we have something specific. Uh, we have a social market economy, we have political democracies, and we have peace. And taking this together, this creates something unique. We are not missionaries, but we are promoting those values. And of course, if we have the occasion that uh, young democracies can join us, uh, this is part of our mission statement. This, they are, then you are in the heart of the European Union. The British historian Timothy Garton Ashi has called it the power of induction, making something happen in an object close to you by magnetic attraction. So that was a nice picture of this. Uh... Yeah, you can call it also in another way. Uh, we are sexy. Uh, we are attractive. We are attractive because the, as long as people want to join us, uh, then then uh, I think it's fine. It's fine. So even uh, today the euro is sexy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Never expected it. Uh, I think it is a deserved prize. What the European Union has done for peace, and this is exactly the main, let's say, um, goal of the Nobel Peace Prize, is remarkable. In fact, I have to be very sincere with you, I had a secret hope mm. for some years already that one day the European Union will be recognized as deserving the Nobel Peace Prize. So we're talking about European values, the idea of Europe. Is there any particular moment in your life when you realized that uh, a common European cause is worth fighting for? Look, uh, it was linked to my experience in Portugal. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, as I've told you, um, we had the democratic revolution in 74. I was 18 years of age. I was already against the previous regime. I was at that time a very radical student, uh, <laughs> demonstrating against uh, uh, the regime. And for, for my generation in Portugal, like the same generation in Spain or Greece, and later we saw this in Poland and in all the Central Eastern European countries, also the Baltic countries, Europe is above all freedom. As we've talked about the EU has been a promoter of democracy in many countries, including the one you grew up in. But then, is it not a, a paradox that the EU is constantly being criticized for a democratic deficit uh, itself? The system is not perfect, and that there is a perceived distance uh, between citizens and institutions. Yes, we want to address this problem, but partly this is due to the fact that we don't have yet a European public space. Mm. We have uh, 27, I sometimes say 28 public spaces, the sp public space of each of our country, mm. plus the space of discussion here in the European institutions, in Brussels or in Strasbourg with the European Parliament. But progressively we have to make um, this um, public space become more real so that uh, the European democracy is not only a formal democracy but becomes more material, let's say in substance, uh, a project of participation. One thing is to recognize what our shortcomings are and they are uh, real, or our problems. Another thing is to put at risk this great project of peace and of freedom and solidarity that the European Union is and will continue to be. Has it been difficult uh, to use humor and be interested in people during all these uh, crisis uh, summits? Have you ever wanted to just tell everyone to pack everything and go home and go back to Portugal? In some cases, the only uh, weapon we have is humor. Mm. And to be fair, these negotiations sometimes are painful, but at the end you come to the results. Mm. Negotiations are extremely important. Uh, and uh, I personally don't like uh, in the politics or diplomacy, those people that go for a negotiation as a kind of a, a zero-sum game, I win against the other. A negotiation is one with the other, not one against the other. In response to questions about the lack of efficient solutions to the debt crisis, you have responded several times that it's important to remember that this is a marathon and not a sprint. But even a marathon has a, has a finishing line. Do you see any sign of that uh, finishing line on, uh, on the horizon? 
We are closer, but not yet there, to be honest. Huh? The other day I received the same question of you, but compared to a football match, and my answer was, we are in the beginning of the second half. Okay. <laughs> the first, but we are happy. No, no, no player went out <laughs> against all the predictions. We are keeping all, t all our team intact. And now we are in the first, half, the first part of the second half. Let's keep the team motivated, focused until the end so that we can score a goal and avoid a prolongation for extra time. I believe that's where we are in this moment fa facing the financial crisis in Europe. To be honest, it was a surprise and I was, it was a very emotional moment for me. I was proud and I felt honored. When did the idea of Europe become important to you? I participated in an exchange between my school in Germany and my high school and the high school in Bordeaux in France. And I went to a family where the parents were active members of the French resistance against the Germans. And they were a long time reluctant to receive a German in the house. And uh, when I left from the family, uh, I understood for the first time what it means. Uh, after the First and the Second World War, cooperation, for example, between my country and France, uh, what, it does, what does it mean uh, to forgive crimes committed in the name of the German nation by those who suffered under the German occupation. These were moments where I understood uh, which historical gift the European Union is for us, especially for us, the Germans. Where would you start looking if you were to, to summarize what it means to be a, a European uh, today? But national identity is strong because national identity gives a feeling of security to people. The European Union is created to save our heritage, our cultural, cultural heritage, the art, the literature, our movies, our landscape. This is our heritage and we should save it. It's wonderful to have a German identity or an Italian one or a French one. It's wonderful to have this multicultural, multi-ethnic, multilinguistic, multi-religious continent. And uh, we should save it, but we should be honest. For cultural identity, for multilingualism, for the past of Renaissance and Baroque, our children will not get jobs in the 21st century. Therefore, Europe is not there to replace our identity. To be a European means to save what we had in the past and to add what we need in the future. Therefore, the challenge for the European Union in the 21st century is to play an economic role, to play an environmental role, to play a regulatory role on the financial markets as a strong political and economic power. The price is given to the EU at a time of considerable economic and social tension. But to what extent do you think that this tension is a threat to peace and stability on the continent? Could one imagine that the inner conflicts themselves are as big a threat to peace as conflicts between nations? Yes, my answer is quite clear, yes. And if we look to the reality of uh, our European Union, the biggest threat for the Union and for the internal stability of the Union is uh, this unbalanced development, this gap between rich and the poorer countries. The Nobel Committee mentions enlargement as an important part of the reason why the EU is given this prize, not least because of the way the EU attracts and affects societies close to the Union. In your view, is the EU using this power the way it should these days? The enlargement process is, in my eyes, one of the biggest success. We are living in uh, times where we forget very fast. 22 years ago, the Soviet Union was still existing. Far more than the half of my lifetime, I left in this bipolar world. I was on the good side and they were on the bad side. My country was divided. Uh, I have a friend, Donald Tusk, the Prime Minister of Poland, who is uh, from the same year born, 55, like me. 
I was born in freedom. He was born in Danzig under communist dictatorship. I ran for the first time for the European Parliament in 84. There was a communist dictatorship. The second time in 89, my second uh, run for the European Parliament. He was still in prison. And in 94, when I was elected, he was free. And today he is a prime minister of this country and I'm the president of the European Parliament, working together for the future of our continent. It's fascinating.